Hi there. So in our last video, we talked about uh, how the cell regulates cyclin D at the transcriptional level. Cyclin D gene can be on or off, and if the cell wants to increase levels of cyclin D, it can activate transcription factors that will help promote the production of cyclin D at the transcriptional level. Now we're going to talk about how cells regulate the level of cyclin D protein at the post-translational level. And when we're talking about something regulated at the post-translational level, many times we're talking about this process called ubiquitylation, also known as ubiquitination. And just a review of this process, um, ubiquitylation is used by cells to control protein degradation by a complex known as the proteasome. The proteasome is a multi-subunit um, complex found in cells and is responsible for destroying proteins. So you can think of it like a protease, but in fact it is a much more complex uh, multifunctional protease that is tightly regulated. And we're going to see how it's regulated right now. So uh, very often cells want to control the level of a protein. They want high levels of protein, they want low levels of a protein. Um, well, cells don't really have wants or needs, but we'll talk about it in that respect. So if a cell wants to uh, keep levels of a protein low, it can uh, accomplish this by ubiquitylation. So our players here are a protein called a ubiquitin ligase, also known as an E3 ubiquitin ligase. This process of ubiquitylation uh, utilizes a number of different enzymes, sometimes referred to as E1, E2, E3, and E4. This video is just going to focus on the step that involves the E3 ubiquitin ligase. So ubiquitin ligases are enzymes. Sometimes they're a single protein or they're a multi-protein subunit complex. And ligases, um, ligases are just enzymes that conjugate the formation of covalent bonds. So a ubiquitin ligase is going to facilitate the conjugation of a bond between a small protein known as ubiquitin and the substrate protein for the ubiquitin ligase. Enzymes have substrates, and so ubiquitin ligases bind to their substrates. They have a substrate binding pocket. They will interact with their substrate, and when they do, they will conjugate the uh, covalent bond between the small protein known as ubiquitin and a lysine residue, the, actually the amine group of a lysine residue of their substrate protein. So what we see here is a ubiquitin ligase conjugating ubiquitin to a protein, uh, to a specific lysine in the amino acid sequence of that protein. And again, it does that because the ubiquitin ligase binds to and recognizes this protein via the substrate binding domain and then conjugates the ligation or conjugation of ubiquitin to its substrate. This uh, continues to occur on lysines within ubiquitin, so you end up forming, the cell forms, a uh, ubiquitin tail, sometimes known as a polyubiquitin tail or a polyubiquitin tag. So this ligase will conjugate um, one uh, ubiquitin to the protein, and then it will grab another ubiquitin molecule and conjugate that uh, covalently to that ubiquitin, and then grab another ubiquitin and conjugate it or ligate it to, a, to that ubiquitin. And you get this uh, ubiquitin tail or polyubiquitin tail. This tail has very high affinity for the proteasome. So if this protein needs to be destroyed, it becomes ubiquitylated, so that's the process we just saw there, uh, being attached with one ubiquitin after another. And that protein has high affinity for the proteasome, enters the proteasome, and uh, comes out the other side in very small peptides. So the protein has now been destroyed. So that is just the process of ubiquitylation reviewed. And the reason we're reviewing it now is because the, pro the cyclin D protein is, uh, is one of many proteins in the cell that's regulated uh, by ubiquitylation. So let's see that here. So when cells are in G1, uh, cells want to keep the level of cyclin D protein low because cyclin D, when its levels rise, we'll see shortly, is going to trigger the progression of G1 to S phase transition. 
So how can the cell keep levels of cyclin D low? In the last video, we talked about regulating cyclin D levels at the transcriptional level, inactivating transcription factors so we can keep the promoter off. Now we're going to talk about regulating its destruction in the G1 phase. So we're going to introduce a new uh, protein complex. This is actually a multi-subunit uh, protein complex known as SCF. It is a ubiquitin ligase, and its substrate is cyclin D. Uh, but not all the time, only under certain conditions. So, how do, so this process is regulated. The destruction of cyclin D is regulated. So when cells are in G1, um, the kinase GSK3 beta, which we've spoken about previously, is active. So GSK3 beta is an active kinase, and it has many substrates. One of its substrates is the threonine at position 286 in the cyclin D protein. So when cells are in G1, GSK3 beta is active and is phosphorylating cyclin D at this specific threonine, and this phosphorylation increases the affinity for SCF to cyclin D. So now these two proteins have high affinity for one another. And now that they have a high affinity, what's SCF going to do? Well, it's the ubiquitin ligase. It's binding to its substrate. So it's going to grab a ubiquitin protein and conjugate it or ligate it to the cyclin D. And there you go, there's ubiquitilation. And it's going to continue to ubiquitilate those ubiquitins. And so now you have this polyubiquitin tail or tag. And we know what that does. That has a very high affinity for the proteasome. So what happens to any cyclin D protein made during the G1 phase? It is destroyed. So cells are able to maintain low levels of cyclin D by destroying it or reducing its half-life or stability. Those are very common terms used when referring to the levels of protein in the cell. So the cell can keep the levels of cyclin D low normally. Now let's say a cell is getting a signal to go into S phase, a normal cellular signal, like it's being exposed to growth factors. Under those conditions, we know that the GSK3 beta protein is often phosphorylated by its kinase, AKT, which will inactivate the kinase activity of GSK3 beta. So under these conditions, GSK3 beta will not be phosphorylating cyclin D at that 3 and 286. So under these conditions, SCF and cyclin D, they have very low affinity for one another, so they will not be interacting likely. If they don't interact, then cyclin D protein is not ubiquitilated and not destroyed. So we refer to that as becoming stable or increasing its half-life, uh, and its levels are allowed to rise. And now that cyclin D levels are rising, cyclin D can go and um, perform its function, which we talked about in the earlier video. The function of cyclin D is to bind to the cyclin-dependent kinases, CDK4 and CDK6. And when cyclin D binds to these kinases, it allows these kinases to phosphorylate their substrates, the RB, or retinoblastoma protein. And phosphorylating RB is a uh, a key step in the transition from G1 to S phase, which we'll talk about in a later video. So this video was a review of the process of ubiquitilation, uh, just overall in general, and more specifically how ubiquitilation regulates the level of the cyclin D protein.